Let me show you the way that I did this. Now, I have a new diagram here, okay? And unlike the previous diagrams that I, I just showed you, which were for a specific Z1 and a specific Z2, here I've got Z1 and Z2 positioned in somewhat arbitrary positions. Um, you can see I've marked in angles of alpha and beta because just like the very first time I tried this question, alpha and beta really can be equal to anything. You will notice that I've positioned uh, Z1 and Z2 in the first quadrant, and that's just for convenience. At the end of this proof, I'm just going to um, run you through the fact that the logic I've employed for this proof does work wherever A and B are. They can be in any quadrants you like and they can indeed have any magnitude that you like. But how can I go about this, right? Well, what I want to try and do is, if I've got Z1 and Z2 here, I want to try and understand what is happening with this Z1 plus Z2 thing. That's what I did up here with this um, with this, with this construction over here. Z1 plus Z2, if I can understand where that is, I can get some geometric relationships happening. So I'm going to employ some of that same logic I did. This is the whole point of me using a specific example, um, which will give me logic that applies generally. Uh, I'm going to keep on thinking of these things in vector terms, right? So if I've got A as um, the position of Z1 and B as the position of Z2, then um, OA and OB can be thought of as vectors that get me to Z1 and Z2. So what would Z1 plus Z2 look like? Well, uh, it would mean that I carry out these vectors in sequence. I would do Z1 and then I would do Z2, which would take me somewhere in this direction. Now, luckily for me, I've got some technology here which will allow me to do this precisely. In fact, I don't need to do that. I'm gonna take this, if I can aim properly. That is my Z2, uh, it's sort of an equivalent vector to Z2. Um, it sends me off further into the first quadrant. And this point up here, which I'm going to mark with a new color, this point up here will be Z1 plus Z2. Let's give that a new name, let's call it P over here, right? Now, this is important because you can see what I've got up here to get to Z1 plus Z2. Um, you can see that there is there are some angles here that are gonna be related to each other. If, let's actually change the color of this. I think it might be a little bit clearer. If I change these both to this, and if I also change this to be a little bit different. Okay, um, you can see what I've got here. There's this kind of the makings of constructions underneath here that form actually what kind of shape? This is a rhombus. Now, why is it a rhombus? You can see it looks like a rhombus, but how do I know that that is the case? And the answer is because I know that Z1 and Z2, um, the property I know about them is that they share the same modulus. So I can say, well, if this is some modulus R, then so is this. Right, But that means that because I got uh, this vector in here by duplicating this OB vector, right? So AP as a vector is the same as OB in terms of its direction and its magnitude. That is also its length, right? So therefore I can say, well that's R, and by extension, same kind of logic, that's R over there. Now, you may well remember that what you've got here is a, um, a rhombus which has lots of important properties. For example, um, you can see that I've got congruent triangles on the opposite sides of this diagonal. In fact, let me just, uh, I'll shade it in. I think I could use this color. Uh, let's make it a bit thinner though. Let's highlight this triangle up here. A bit off in terms of my accuracy. There we go, all right. So let's fill this in so you can see what's going on here. Happy times. So do you see that this triangle up here is congruent to this triangle over here? Why is that? Well, it's got these two sides here, R and R, which are equal, and then it's got this common length here in the middle. So they, are, um, they, they both share, all corresponding sides are equal, so therefore this triangle is congruent to this triangle. Now what that means is, all the angles are also going to be congruent, or we would normally say equal. And that's hugely important to me because my proof has to do with angles. So I've got all my pieces in place now. I'm gonna now start to uh, try and unpack how it is that I prove the result up the top, which remember where we're going. It is that the argument of Z1, Z2, in this case is equal to the argument of Z1 plus Z2 squared. Okay. Let's try and do this. 
So, what have I got first? Well, I can say that since I should rehearse, I should actually write some of that logic um, that I actually was saying out loud before, but I didn't have as part of my proof. Since Z1, uh, the modulus of Z1 rather, is the modulus of Z2, I can say that this shape here is going to be a rhombus because of what I said about all of these signs being equal. So I can say, what have, what's the name of this shape? O, A, P, B is a rhombus. Okay, so that's good. I now want to use that fact to try and make some, um, you know, do some work with the angles inside of this, okay? Um, so what is, for example, let's mark it in in blue. What is this angle here? This is the angle in the corner of the rhombus. Um, this angle here, uh, angle AOB, that's the name of it. How do I get it in terms of the uh, names of the angles that I've already marked in? Well, you can see I've got alpha, that's this big argument here, and then I've also got beta, this little argument here. And uh, the angle AOB is just the difference between those. So I guess I would say it is alpha, the big angle, take away beta, the little angle. Okay, that's really good. Now I can then say, well, if I look at the bottom part of this angle, which I'm going to highlight here, no, that's too coarse. Let's try a small one. This angle in here. This angle is going to be half of that angle AOB, right? Angle POB, POB is going to be exactly half of that angle. How can I reason that? Well, number one, I talked about these congruent triangles here. All the angles are the same. Or you could lead to the fact that because I've already proved that this is a rhombus, uh, maybe your knowledge of quadrilateral properties from years seven and eight is a little bit dusty in there. I can say it's because um, diagonals in a rhombus, diagonals in rhombus, oops, that's very messy. O, A, P, B. Um, what do they do? They bisect the angles that they pass through. So that's why I went from alpha minus beta to half alpha minus beta, okay? So what have I got? Let's, let's just fill that in. This little blue angle in here is half of alpha minus beta. Okay, now, uh, what is the use of that? Well, then I can say, well, to try and get towards argument of Z1 plus Z2 squared, I first need to work out the argument of Z1 plus Z2, which, which I have here. And I can get that in terms of these angles I already have. So I can say, all right, well, let's try and get to, oopsie daisy, the argument of Z1 plus Z2. What is that in terms of all of my geometric terms? Well, it's going to be, uh, let's see here, it's going to be angle uh, B, O, C plus angle P, O, B, which I just worked out there. You can see um, that's P, O, B there. So this is going to give me, and uh, maybe I actually should have written this first, so I'll just move this down a little bit. That will actually give me the entire angle P, O, C. So you can follow my logic there, uh, and that's because these are adjacent angles. Now I worked out what each of these were, one by definition and one by this uh, construction up here. So I can say, what's BOC? That's beta. And then I've got um, a half alpha minus beta. So this is promising. I can actually collect some like terms here because I've got, I'm gonna put the half terms out the front first, half alpha minus half beta plus beta. That's gonna be half alpha plus half beta, just collecting my beta terms together and I'm going to factorize out that half. Now, I wonder if, if it hasn't already, if this is the point at which everything has clicked for you. This is the argument of Z1 plus Z2. So remember where I'm trying to go, right? We already worked out from our first kind of, you know, uh, failure of a proof that where I'm trying to get to is alpha plus beta. And I have got that angle, but exactly half here. So what should I do? I should double. The argument here, Z1 plus Z2 equals just alpha plus beta. But, and there's so many different ways you could say this, but a nice convenient way to say it is that double uh, this angle here is clearly going to be that argument. That's what happens when you take a complex number 
and you multiply it by itself. Uh, this is kind of a weird uh, off-header way of using De Moivre's theorem, right? If you were to square a complex number, z1 plus z2 is this complex number up here, what do you do to its argument? Well, you double it, right? So that's me going sort of backwards in logic. So I might just jot that down. That's me going up here by way of De Moivre's theorem. So it's also true in reverse, or you might say it's converse. So that's alpha plus beta, um, but I can then further say this is actually also what happens um, when you have alpha plus beta being the arguments of Z1 plus the argument of Z2. That's what alpha is and that's what beta is, which is, we're almost there, I'm going to take this here and I'm going to duplicate it. Uh, what happens when you're adding arguments or why would you add arguments and the answer is it's what happens when you multiply two complex numbers together. Uh, you multiply the uh, moduli and you add the arguments which is what I'm doing going from that line to that line. So this is the result as required. Uh, we went about it a bit of a, a, a circuitous path but I hope you can see by my geometric logic um, this is how I've landed up here at this result over here. Whew, take a breath. Now, right at the start of this proof, the proof that actually worked as opposed to me looking at specific examples, right? Right at the beginning of this proof I said, yes I know I have drawn Z1 and Z2 so they are in the first quadrant, um, just to make things convenient for me, um, but I, I sort of suggested that the logic that I've just employed, it will work no matter where Z1 and Z2 are, so long as they have the same modulus. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and illustrate why that is, and it will also bring us back to um, why we had to use uh, this property here that Z1 and Z2 have the same module. So let's have a look at this dynamically. This is a desmosified version. Um, I don't know if that's a real word, I just made it up. Uh, this is a desmos version of what we constructed just now. We have a Z1 and a Z2. Um, you can see uh, here's my Z1 in blue and my Z2 in red. And then Z1 plus Z2, you can see the construction there by way of um, putting together these um, uh, vectors, right? So the, the dotted lines you can see are the equivalent vectors just moved over so that you can make Z1 plus Z2 happen, okay? You can also see this green dotted circle which is how I'm ensuring that Z1 and Z2 have the same modulus because they're the same distance from the origin, um, so that's why you've got a consistent radius. So you can see here that you're going to get this rhombus situation happening and that's the key, right? No matter where, um, you know, you arrange Z1 and Z2 with varying angles, you know, I can move I can move Z1 up this way or down this way. Um, you can see you're still getting a, a rhombus, right? And that's how um, the logic works. Now, this is really important. Let me just zoom out a little bit. It's really important now that you can convince yourself that this will still work if you move out of the first quadrant. So if I put Z2 over here in the second quadrant, let me see if I got that right, there you go. You can see Z2 is now in a funny different spot, um, but you're still getting this rhombus happening between the origin Z1 and Z2 and Z1 plus Z2. So still got a um, still got a rhombus. All of the constructions that I did before, they'll have slightly different letters or your subtraction might be going in a slightly different order, but you'll still get the same bisection of angles happening between the Z1 vector, the Z2 vector, and they get bisected by this Z1 plus Z2 vector. And you can see I can uh, move it down into the third quadrant if I like, or indeed the fourth. I can have both of the numbers in, uh, in different quadrants. So let me move this one over here. That's a bit weird, um, but you can see, always got a rhombus there, uh, and that's because of the fact that if you add two uh, complex numbers together, you get the parallelogram law. You might recall that from one of our very first lessons, our very first weeks in complex numbers. You always create a parallelogram, but, and this comes to this specific question, you don't always get a rhombus. Why are we getting a rhombus? And it's because Z1 and Z2 have the same modulus. They're on the circumference of this circle. This is where I'm going to now show you, let's bring it back to a first quadrant example. This is where I'm going to show you why it is important that uh, you've got the same modulus for each one. I'm going to give you an exaggerated example here of if I move Z2 such that it doesn't have the same modulus as Z1. So let's, for example, let's move it in closer here, okay? Now, Z1 and Z2 no longer share the same modulus and so you would expect that our result is not true. And indeed that is what happens, right? The reason why is because if you have a look, let's zoom in here, right? If you have a look at what's happened to our shape here, I no longer have a rhombus, I've got a parallelogram still, but the 
geometric property of a rhombus that I was relying on, namely that you've got these congruent triangles, um, but not just congruent triangles, they, they end up with your angles kind of matching together, um, bisecting in the corners. You can see here my angle, uh, you know, from Z1 to the origin over to Z1 plus Z2. You can see um, that angle is not the same as the angle from Z2 to the origin up to Z1 plus Z2, right? Um, one of them is uh, much narrower than the other. You're not getting a bisection of angles happening anymore. So the congruence is actually flipped upside down if you have a think about those two triangles. And so this bisection only happens when Z1 and Z2, I'll actually bring Z1 in a bit closer, when Z1 and Z2 share the same modules. That's what makes the construction work. It's what gives me the ability to use this property in here, that di the diagonals in a rhombus bisect those angles. So this is really crucial. This is kind of the, the engine of my proof. I can't do anything uh, down here, you know, like um, having these half angles and then adding them all together. It ends up completely different if you just have a parallelogram. So that's why uh, this result, which is about angles, relies on this um, basis or foundation, which is to do with lengths. So, um, I hope that was illuminating for you, not just the solution, but also kind of the dead ends that I had um, to pursue before I arrived at my actual solution. I hope me going through my, um, my proof has convinced you that actually um, these, these kinds of things that I did up here were enormously important for my brain to, um, to wrap some scaffolding around this question. Um, I still employed logic like, oh, this, I've got to get to an alpha plus beta, right? I knew I was going to get there when I started out this proof, and so it made my destination a lot easier to work out. So good luck with trying out questions like this. Remember, even if you don't arrive at the solution the first time through, um, sometimes that <laughs> failed attempt at a solution will be the bridge uh, or the scaffolding to get to the real solution.